I would like to welcome everybody to our first ever online session of the Reformed Church Center, and our first ever online gathering, which is also the 2020 Women's Stories Day. Um, I was reflecting as I got ready this morning that New Brunswick Seminary has not been stopped in its operations by um, at last count, nine different wars, the Spanish influenza, or probably a couple of other plagues, or even the Great Depression. So New Brunswick Seminary just keeps on going through the current crisis. We just have to go differently, as often happens. Um, I'm glad that all of you can be here. Others will be joining us during the morning um, as, as you as we listen to speakers one after the other, I will, I will be introducing folks, but also at the end of each speaker's presentation, except for Damaris, because she's doing devotions and presenting the word of God, she doesn't have to, she doesn't get questions and answers afterwards. Um, God has been questioning her enough, I'm sure, on the way to getting to, getting to this meeting. Um, because of that, um, if you have a question for someone, Please put your full name in the Zoom chat group. I'm asking for full names because your webcam addresses aren't always full names, and we may have more than one of somebody with the same name. There are there should be 50 some of us on the meeting at one point or another by the time the day is over. So please put your name in the chat group into chat, uh, just like that. <laughs> Joanne Van Zant. Joanne, do you have a question already? Or are you just lining up? You're lining up early. Um, anyway, so do that, and we'll know to who to call on and in what order. Uh, by the way, just to review, after I finish saying welcome, and I do not have to explain where the coffee and the bathrooms and other things are today, but I will say welcome. Um, it, Damaris, Damaris Whitaker from Fort Washington Church will be leading us in devotions, then we will have welcomes from Liz Testa of Women's Transformation and Leadership and Kathy Proctor from New Brunswick Seminary. Then Lynn Jappinga, our Gennady Fellow for this year, will make her presentation. Then Irma Williams, then Pamela Pater Ennis. Lynn Min, who was supposed to be here and presenting with us today, is ill. Um, she seems to have the plain old fashioned conventional flu and um, not, not the thing that's keeping all the rest of us home, but do keep her in your prayers. Um, she is trying to put together her notes and things so that after this sometime, probably early next week, we hope that we'll, those will be posted on the website near where the recording of this meeting will be so that you can look at all that and um, look at her notes then. We really are very sorry that she could not be here with us. Um, as we look ahead to in the life of the Reformed Church Center, um, just want to let you know about a couple of things in advance. One of them has just one of the one of them is an event that has just been created out of this current crisis. On Tuesday, March thirty first at seven o'clock, there will be a webinar that will run about half an hour, maybe forty five minutes at the most, but probably more like half an hour talking about communion and COVID-19 and asking the question, what is the reformed theology for doing remote communion or not doing remote communion? And if we don't, what does a fast from the Lord's Supper look like for us all as we wait to be able to gather again? And what does that mean, especially for celebrations such as Maundy Thursday, when we would normally be celebrating the supper? And the speakers for that event will be Mishona Walston, the pastor at First Church in Albany, New York, John Whitfleet, director of Calvin Institute for Christian Worship, Matthew Van Maastricht, who teaches standards and polity for New Brunswick Seminary and for the Western Seminary Distance Program, and Ron Reinstra, who is worship professor at Western Theological Seminary. As I say, that will be March 31st at seven, hopefully Monday, certainly Tuesday at the latest, there will be, a, there will be more information up at nbts.edu and on our Facebook page, and you'll be able to contact me to get in on that Zoom meeting. If you can't be at that Zoom meeting, the recording will be posted 
at mbts.edu after so that you can find out what we shared and what we thought about to give you things to think about as we get ready. Then we'll be looking ahead to the fall when, God willing, we will all be meeting back together in person again. On October 15th, the Reformed Church Center will be celebrating its 20th anniversary with a dinner at New Brunswick Seminary. And our key, keynote speaker will be Leslie Copeland Toon, the Chief Operating Officer of the National Council of Churches. On November 12th, we will have our long-awaited and unfortunately delayed from spring Liturgy and Justice Seminar with John Bell from the Iona community. The registration for that is now up and running and on nbts.edu, go to Reformed Church Center under about, go to click on About Us, go to Reformed Church Center, go to Events and find Liturgy and Justice with John Bell and you will find things so that you can register and get your tickets for that. And then at, right after Thanksgiving, the date is being finalized, but right after Thanksgiving, um, Bill Howard, who was the first director of the African American Black Council of the RCA, um, will be talking about his new book, Black Not Dutch, which deals with the Reformed Church in America's ongoing response, especially in the early years when he was at the Black Council to the Black Manifesto. So all those things are coming up in the fall. The fall is already very busy. And last but certainly not least, we hope the spring is going to, spring of 2021 will be busy as well. Um, and part of that is to invite people to become fellows of the Reformed Church Center for short-term fellowships. The Hazel Gennady Fellowship in Reformed Church Women's Studies, which Lynn Japinga is taking advantage of this year and been able to use and is going to share results with us about that. That fellowship is one of three that we have. Um, you can apply for all of them at nbts.edu under research. Um, the Gennady Fellowship in Women's Studies, the Smith Fellowship in RCA History, or the Pop and Young Fellowship in Reformed Worship, all of those are available for next year. And because of the COVID outbreak, kind of confusing things this month. And because the IRS is no longer using April 15th as its deadline this year, so it was open, the deadline for submitting those applications has been moved to April 15th. The, the um, fellowship affords someone with two weeks of residency at New Brunswick, if they need the residency, a $500 stipend and access to the seminary, the RCA, archives, Sage Library, and through Sage Library to Alexander Library at Rutgers, as well as if you're doing the, um, the Pop and Young Fellowship to a, host of, to a host of different worshiping congregations in the New York metropolitan area. So I hope that some of you, if you've got a question that you've always wanted to explore, will um, take advantage of one of those. Um, and um, find out what you need to do. I just saw Sally, Young, Sally Ann's question in the chat. Um, if you registered for the February event and purchased tickets, et cetera, um, you probably got your ticket money back. You should have through your credit card because we sent it all back to them. And so you do need to re-register for November. It was simply too confusing for us to keep track of who was registered before and who was registered new and who might not have remembered if they registered the first time it was easier to start off with a clean slate. James, can I um, just add to that? Sally Ann, I will get back to you because I think we had three people register after the time when they weren't supposed to be um, registering. So I'll get back to Sally Ann. Okay, so let us get on with our, our morning. Damaris Whitaker is pastor of Fort Washington Collegiate she is the first female pastor of Fort, at Fort Washington and the first Latina to serve the collegiate churches in their 400 year history. Um, she preaches in English and Spanish. She is a public theologian, deeply passionate about social justice, advocating for racial justice, LGBTQ equality, immigration reform, women's leadership, universal health care, and affordable housing. Um, she believes she has been called into ministry to break down silos and sees the inter intersection of 
faith and public life as a place where she can affect change. We are so very pleased that she's able to be our worship leader, even virtually. So ladies and gentlemen, she will begin us with worship. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to begin inviting you to join me uh, in a centering prayer. Uh, so wherever you are, uh, please close your eyes and put yourself in a comfortable position and let us pray together. Here we are, God, together in this time and place. We're gathering from so many different directions. We become aware of our being here, our bodies in the chair, our feet on the floor, our hands on our laps. We are aware of our breathing. And we thank you for our breathing. We are aware of the beating of our hearts and we place our hands on our hearts and we feel that beat. We also are aware of those around us, perhaps our children or our pets or the neighbor's dog, or the neighbor who slammed the door too loudly, or the noise in the city. At a time of social distancing and a pandemic, we are thrust into a kind of cocoon. And we are all forced to retire and undergo change here at this time as individuals and as a community. This cocoon houses parts of us, parts of us that we like, parts of us that we don't like. It makes us aware of our anxiety and our fears and our stress and our tiredness. This cocoon houses parts of our family that we love and cherish, but also parts that we do not like. This cocoon houses parts of our world that we appreciate and love and are grateful for, but also that we struggle with and we don't like. Yet this morning, we come from our living rooms or our dining tables or our kitchens or our bedrooms in so many, from so many different directions. And we give you our consent. We give you our consent so that your compassionate presence transforms every part of us into something beautiful. And we pause to become aware of this cocoon that we have been placed, I would say, without our consent. And may this cocoon surround us and makes us aware of the gift that there is in silence and of your life-giving change. I'm inviting us to be just a few seconds in silence together.
And while we're in silence, let us just take a deep breath. God be with us this day as we listen to one another, as we open our hearts and our spirits to a new day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, this morning I thought that uh, the lectionary offering of uh, Psalm 23rd uh, was appropriate for us to just have a few minutes of reflection together. And I'm going to read uh, just a, a couple of verses, and then um, we'll just have a time of reflection. God is my shepherd. I shall not want. God makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. God restores my soul and leads me in right paths for the sake of God's name. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And the lectionary provides us uh, with this Psalm at a time where we are in a very unprecedented situation, at least in my lifetime, and I'm sure most of your lifetimes as well. This uh, coronavirus, the COVID-19, have taken us unaware. And we're preaching this psalm, uh, some of us will tomorrow, uh, at a time also of Lent, uh, where we're preparing as Christians for the Easter celebration, for resurrection, where we are having times of introspection and reflection, when we have fasted so that we can prepare ourselves and center ourselves. And we're talking about this text this morning, knowing that perhaps some of us, if not all of us, might be walking in what the psalmist describes as the darkest valley. We're worried about our children, uh, those of you who are homeschooling this week and in the weeks to come are perhaps wondering, how am I gonna make it? Uh, I'm a pastor, so I got a couple emails this week about, can someone help me? This is crazy, I can't stay in this house with these kids. I mean, and although that was, um, you know, that was not a serious email, but you know, it was just reflective of how our lives are changing at this time. But we also preach from this or, or consider this text at a time where we are leaders and some of us, and we're expected to, to, be, to be and to have a calming presence and to have a presence overall. And how are we so ever so challenged to do that today? Um, I can speak perhaps for all of you that tomorrow you are going to be either live streaming or uh, just sharing the recording of your Sunday service in, our ver in the various uh, social media platforms. But one of the things that really struck me from the, the text is not necessarily the dark valley, but, but the statement that that it that has about walking in the valley as it refers to God. And the statement is, for you are with me. And in the old English is, for thou art with me. And what does it mean that God is with us at this time? It means that we are in a process of change. And so we should, should resist trying to keep business as usual. 
we are hearing so many messages from corporate America and all of our um, HR people as you know how hard we should be working at this time as if nothing had happened. But friends, something has happened. And I think that the hardest job that we are gonna be doing during this time that we are practicing social distancing is that we are going to have to get used to silence, quiet. We are gonna to have to get used to not working 80 hours a week as we are doing, years on end. We're gonna to have to get used to at understanding that maintenance and care has the same value as productivity. And for some of us that are workaholics, and that's not a batch of honor, that is a problem that I have and other people have, um, that, is a, that is a place where we have to say, you know, God, I have to remember that you are with me in this struggle of understanding that I'm not gonna be able to go as fast as I'm used to. What does it mean that God is with us at this time? Yes, that we listen and believe science, that we do these webinars as the seminary is doing, even for its first time, that we enter new territories. What does it mean that God is with us? That we take time to breathe. And in breathing, we may lead. And we, I would argue we may lead more excellently. What does it mean that God is with us at this moment? That we don't forget about those who are less fortunate than us. That we create ways in which we can continue to do justice at a time of fear and disenfranchisement. What does it mean that God is with us? It means that whatever lies ahead of us, we're not alone down here. We have each other and the spirit is still moving among us. And so as we enter this day together this morning, I invite you to focus less in the dark valley and more in the presence of God. I invite us to give us permission to do a little less. And I preach that with no integrity this week. I have worked seven days a week, all day, almost every day, trying to get everything ready so that we are connected, 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 connected. I just want to make sure that we are connected, connected. <laughs> and finally, yesterday, I realized we're not going to have all groups being connected. We're not going to have everyone so connected. We're just going to do the best that we can to stay together to be a community, and to be able to just stand in place with one another in whatever way that uh, manifests in the next few weeks. But most importantly, I too had to say to myself, self, care and maintenance is as important as productivity. And that is God with us. God moving among us in the lives of our children and in our community, in the life of our congregations, in the life of our elderly, of which we, we worry so much about them and we wanna be so present for them. And so I wanna name that we are stressed and exhausted and anxious and we are, worried about church growth and stewardship, and we're worried about the health of our most vulnerable members and communities. And I'm worried about the hungry around Fort Washington and the homeless, and what are we gonna do? Let's start this 
this morning by just acknowledging that God is with us, that we will breathe, God is with us, and the road ahead will be shown for us. Amen. Amen. The, the Reformed Church Center could not make Women's Stories Day happen all by ourselves. And we never, we never have even tried. And all every step of the way, we have had the wonderful partnership with Women's Transformation and Leadership from the RCA. And so I'm so pleased that um, Liz Testa is able to be here with us for at least part of the day and that she is here to bring greetings from the RCA. Good morning, everyone. Grace and peace to you. And I want to thank our wonderful pastor, Reverend Damaris, for that really beautiful and um, moving, personally moving devotion. Um, también te agradezco en español. You know, so first of all, just as a formality, thank you, Reverend Brum, Brother Brum, and the Reformed Church Center uh, and New Brunswick Theological Seminary for the wonderful ongoing partnership. Um, the Women's Transformation and Leadership Office is there on site at the seminary, and I have the privilege as uh, a denominational executive to be the General Secretary's designee from the Reformed Church in America sitting on the board um, as ex officio. And so it gives me wonderful opportunities to be connected. Um, really uh, rang very deeply for me, um, Pastor's devotion, uh, talking around connecting, making sure people are connected, right? And that's, that's really, um, it's my heartbeat is connection. And so one of the ways that God really gave me a wonderful opportunity to make sure that women's transformation and leadership was not kind of an insular thing was to place us there at New Brunswick. And so um, our brother president, Michael McCreary, Kathy Proctor, James Brum, Joan Marshall, uh, Amanda Rule, uh, all these wonderful colleagues, Steve Mann, who's our wonderful technical guy today, the director of communication. Um, all of those folks are wonderful partners to us as we seek to do this work. Um, a lot of you who are here today are already very much part of women's transformation and leadership as transforming and leading women in the Reformed Church in America and sister denominations like the United Church of Christ. And, um, and so to say that um, we, we seek to encourage, equip, and empower women to live into their God-given gifts and callings. And so it's really meaningful that, um, that Women's Stories Day which was birthed out of the Reformed Church Center and James Brum's head um, as he was working on the Helen Gennady Fellowship, which Mary Cansfield, who's the creator of it, is with us today. So Mary, um, thank you for leading the way and um, planting the seeds that would result in these wonderful events and in that fellowship, uh, that this is one of the ways that the Reformed Church in America has been called to live into its goal to pursue the vision for the full inclusion of women's gifts and influence in all areas of the church. And that is why I was hired. That's why this ministry exists today. And so, so grateful to New Brunswick for the partnership in helping us to continue to lean into that. And I'm really grateful that Lynn is this year's, uh, Lynn Jappinga is this year's um, Helen Ganabi. Uh, scholar, and that she has brought forth this opportunity for us to engage the courage to be honest. So all of the sisters that we'll be sharing today, really grateful for each of you, Lynn Min in absentia, and for the ways that we all are um, strong and courageous to, to be bold, to be honest, and to live into the things we need to live into. And just to call back what Pastor said, um, Pastor uh, Damaris, about breathing, about leading more excellently, about um, embracing care and maintenance as opposed to productivity. What does that all mean for us as we're going in using our gifts and our influence and, and leaning into our leadership fully in this new season? So thank you all for being here. Um, and I'm excited for everything that is to come on this, uh, in this time together. I'm so grateful that it's being recorded so that others will be able to avail themselves of all of the wisdom that will be shared and will be continued to be shared today. 
So thank you all so much. God bless you. And now I'm pleased to be able to call on um, Kathy Proctor um, to bring us greetings from New Brunswick Seminary. May I just quickly interject, I'm sorry, Hazel Gennady, not Helen Gennady, forgive me. I need to have that on record. <laughs> right, right. Okay, you can't see me. Um, I don't know if Steve is going to turn me on, but um, here we go. Um, thank you so much again. As we've heard this um, a few times already today, I'm so glad that you know we're all able to connect in this time where we're talking about you know needing that connection. Uh, thank you, James and Steve, for making this happen, and all our participants. Um, our building is closed at New Brunswick Seminary, but we are very much open. And this is a uh, one example of that. So, um, you know, we want to pray for you and we ask that you pray for us and pray for our students uh, as, um, you know, they're not missing a beat and all of their classes are online. Um, also, in this time, you know, we face, you know, we think, gosh, you know, how is our student um, uh, numbers going to be? Are the students going to be able to continue? Are we going to be able to bring new students in? Um, but during this time, you know, there may be students that, um, or potential students that are accepting the call. You know, God has been calling them, and during this, this hard time, um, they decide to accept it. So please send them our way. You can have them email me or call me direct, directly at cproctor at nbts.edu or on our website, there's a way to connect that way. What we're doing in the admissions department is we are um, gonna be starting some online information sessions. So that'll be happening in the next few weeks. So thank you so much. And um, I don't wanna hold us up anymore. Lynn Jappinga is a professor of religion at Hope College in Holland, Michigan. She is the author of Loyalty and Loss, the Reformed Church in America, 1945 to 1994, which would be a wonderful book even if it wasn't in the RCA historical <laughs> series, and even if I wasn't now, um, by virtue of one of my jobs, obligated to say that those are all wonderful books. She is also the author of Preaching the Women of the Old Testament, Who They Were and Why They Matter. Um, I'm not hiding who published that from you. I just don't have that in front of me. Um, Lynn has been now twice a member of the RCA Commission on History and has served the denomination in various other ways. And she is our 2019-2020 Hazel B. Gennady Fellow in RCA Women's Studies at New Brunswick Theological Seminary. And she will be talking to us about the courage to be honest about divorce and divorce and how the RCA has looked at it. Lynn. Thank you. All right. Um, this is an awkward format for everybody, but I'm going to have to learn how to do it because at Hope College, we're now teaching online for the next five weeks. So I'm going to need to be doing this all the time. Uh, so thanks to James, thanks to New Brunswick Seminary, thanks to Mary and Norm Cansfield for the for funding the Gennady Fellowship. Um, this started out as a kind of a small project uh, off the top of my head, and it's grown into something that's really intriguing me, and uh, it's going to occupy some time on sabbatical next year and probably beyond that. So what I want to do today is say a little bit about um, how people in the church might experience being divorced. And then maybe a little bit of history, although there's a handout that explains a little more of that for you. And a little bit more about the experience of RCA clergy women who are divorced. And then finally, if there's time, some pastoral perspectives on how to deal with divorce in the church. So, so here we go. Thank you. About 15 years ago, the United Church of Christ conducted a survey that asked people why they didn't go to church. And the number one answer was that they had been divorced. Number two was being LGBTQ, and number three was not having the right clothes, which is interesting. Now, it seems to me that many congregations would say, well, of course, divorced people are welcome here. Of course, we're happy to have them. But let's think a little bit about what kinds of things divorced people might hear in church. All right. So you go to church on a, on a Sunday in Epiphany, 
and you hear this text read from Isaiah 62. Uh, Isaiah is trying to encourage the people of Israel to look forward to a better day when God will heal the wounded and rebuild what's been destroyed. And so the passage says, you shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no longer be termed desolate, but you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married. For the de Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a woman and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Okay. So to be married is to be happy. Marriage is a sign of God's favor. To be single is to be forsaken and desolate. So I know metaphors have their limits. But this is not easy language to hear. Think about some of the other biblical texts you might encounter in church. It is not good that the man shall be alone. I shall make a helper appropriate for him. Or from the prophet Malachi. God hates divorce. Thankfully, that's not in the lectionary. Or from the Gospels. Jesus said that whoever divorces his wife and marries again commits adultery. That was in the lectionary just a few weeks ago. Or what if you heard a sermon on the weird story where God tells Hosea to marry a prostitute who will be unfaithful to him? He did, and she was. So the text is very fuzzy about the details. But then the preacher says, look what a great guy Hosea is. No matter how bad Gomer is, Hosea does not divorce her. Of course, Hosea also beat her and deprived her of food and triangulated the children into their dysfunction, but he's held up as a model for couples. If Hosea could put up with his wife's infidelity, you can put up with your spouse's adultery or addiction or emotional absence. If God is faithful to the covenant God makes, then you should be faithful to your marriage covenant, no matter what. This is the word of the Lord. So no wonder it's difficult for divorced people to go to church. Again, churches think they are welcoming of divorced people. But would you feel welcome if divorce was repeatedly used as an example of sin or failure or brokenness? What if you are relieved to be divorced? What if you are finally freed of an abusive or adulterous or addicted or an absent spouse? What if divorce felt more like grace that healed you than sin you need to repent from? Sometimes in trying to uphold marriage, the church has failed to listen to people. That's kind of obvious, I guess. About 30 years ago, a friend consulted her pastor about her abusive marriage. And the pastor told her, Jesus wants you to be married. And my friend said, it was a long time before I went to church again. The church has taught that divorce is a failure, even when it seems like the right thing to do. Recently, a young woman wrote of her divorce on Facebook. I appeared in court and appeared on public record that I had failed at marriage. I have since made mistakes, punished myself, and try to come to terms with the fact that just because you love someone doesn't mean you should be together. And then in a modern love column in the New York Times recently, Carmen Esposito said something similar about her divorce from her wife. She wrote, somehow the only part of my Catholic upbringing that seems to have survived my youth is the feeling that divorce is wrong, preventable, and my fault. She had assumed she would be able to perfectly navigate marriage, but instead she said, all I know is that my wings broke, I'm tired, and my life isn't what I thought it would be. The church doesn't always know what to do with divorced people. Jill English, the director of admissions at Western Seminary, recently wrote a blog post in which she noted that when she was divorced, nobody brought her a casserole. Those who were widowed in her church received an outpouring of support, at least for a little while. Jill was once asked if she would help rake the leaves of a woman who was recently widowed, but she couldn't, she said, because she had to rake her own leaves by herself. 
It's no wonder that some people in the church, in the middle of a divorce, say that they, it would have been easier if their spouse had died. Easier to handle a death than a divorce. And all church members don't want to interfere. They don't want to be judgmental. They don't want to intrude. So often they say nothing, which doesn't always help. People come to the point of divorcing for many reasons. Sometimes they can't survive a major loss. Sometimes they get bored and grow apart. Sometimes the marriage is stressed by children or jobs or families. Sometimes there's adultery or addiction or abuse. Sometimes one person wants a divorce and the other does not. So when I speak of divorce in general, I know that there are many varieties and that there will be exceptions to every generalization. I've been thinking some and reading some about the history of marriage and divorce, which seems relevant to these questions. I've got a lot more to do on this, but think a little bit about marriage in the Bible and the Christian tradition. It is not about finding the perfect person to bring you eternal happiness, right? Think about marriage in the Old Testament. There's Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. There's Jacob and Leah and Rachel and two maids. In the early church, the apostle Paul wished that people would remain unmarried so that they could devote themselves to God. And then marriage began to be used as a way to control family property and pass the wealth down to the legitimate heirs. John Calvin thought marriage was good for men because it gave them a helpmate who made their lives easier. Doesn't say much about what marriage does for women. Um, and then in the United States, when men started to settle on the frontier, they might marry any woman available because it was so much easier to build a life on the frontier with two people rather than one, especially if the one did all the cooking and the cleaning and the child rearing and that sort of thing. So when the church describes marriage as always and forever a holy and indissoluble bond between a man and a woman, it's expressing an ideal more than a reality. I was surprised a bit to read how much, how much marriage has been shaped by religious assumptions about men and women. Even though marriage is a secular, legal activity, it's very much shaped by religion. So men promise to provide for women and their children. Women promise to obey and serve men. And in part, they do that because they are weak and sinful, the tradition of Eve. Even if a woman worked outside the home, her husband owned her labor and was entitled to her wages. So when a woman married, she lost her legal status and personhood. She became Mrs. Him. She was covered by him in a legal term called coverture and had no legal independent status. So needless to say, she didn't have a lot of rights to divorce her husband, even if he was abusive or absent or otherwise nasty. So when feminists in the 19th century started to argue for the right to vote, they were also arguing for basic legal and economic rights for women, including the right to divorce. So the church has again had a lot of influence on the power of divorce, on the right to divorce. So if marriage is holy and indissoluble, then you can't dissolve it, right? So divorce is impossible, the church has said. But the reality is that marriages do fail. And the church was successful for quite a long time in discouraging divorce, but over the last two centuries, they have pretty much lost that ability. They've tried to keep shaping divorce law, but it, it's not worked as well. So on the handout that was sent out over email, I give you a two-page overview of the RCA's stance and positions on divorce over the last um, uh, 120 years, really. Um, so again, just a couple of glimpses of that here. I won't go into detail about that, but around 1900, the RCA was involved with a number of other churches in an inter-church committee on marriage and divorce. And they were trying to get uniform divorce laws. And at the time, New York State, because of the influence of, of the Catholic Church, permitted divorce only for adultery. Only the innocent party in a divorce was allowed to remarry. 
So that really limited the amount of divorces in New York State, but if you had time and money, one spouse could move to say South Dakota, establish residency, live there for 90 days, and the kindly South Dakota judge would grant them a divorce. Needless to say, that caused all kinds of legal problems and the Interchurch Committee hoped that all states would adopt divorce laws as conservative as those of New York State. It didn't happen in part because this divorce mill business in South Dakota and other places was extremely profitable and states did not want to see stricter laws on divorce. So the RCA was very much involved in that and around 1900 there's a kind of a flurry of uh, commentary and discussion in the synod minutes and the Christian intelligence are about divorce. Um, another interesting piece that's relevant to current issues about uh, the denominational position on homosexuality is that in 1948, the classes of Pleasant Prairie in Iowa asked General Synod for a definitive statement on divorce and remarriage. And a committee was appointed to discuss that and they reported back to the Synod of 1949 that the Synod could offer guidelines, but it could not provide rules that every congregation had to follow. Ministers and elders were responsible to decide who could marry and who could be members of the congregation. So if we would adopt that position now on sexuality issues, it would make the denominational position perhaps a little easier to, or it, would, it would make this current crisis perhaps a little easier to navigate. In 1962 and 1975, the Christian Action Commission and the Theological Commission offered papers on divorce and remarriage. They were quite progressive for the time. So you may read those and think, oh, that doesn't sound very progressive to me. But think about a pair, uh, comparison in the, in the um, Protestant Reformed Church, a kind of super conservative break off of the Christian Reformed Church that's in um, Grand Rapids especially. They pretty much refuse to grant any divorce. So if, you, if your spouse committed adultery, you could get a separation but they did not permit any divorce. And if you were unhappy, well, that was just too darn bad. You got married and you were stuck. So when the RCA says, um, you know, that, that they recognize the complexity of divorce and when they refuse to adopt the language of a guilty and an innocent party, uh, when they don't adopt a literal view of the biblical teachings on divorce, when they say that forgiveness is possible and therefore remarriage is possible, that's a pretty progressive um, attitude for the time being. Now, what's striking to me though, is that although those statements seem pretty gracious, I'm not sure they kind of made their way down into the life of the church. Um, in the 1970s, for example, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Divorced people were kind of funneled into support groups for divorced people. And eventually the Good News Community Church was founded as a place where divorced people could be comfortable worshiping. So does that mean that they just weren't welcome in their churches? They had to go elsewhere? Um, about this time also, some churches became known for accepting everybody. That was sometimes a slur. They accept everybody there, even divorced people. So Christ Memorial in Holland, Christ Community in Spring Lake, Michigan, Central Reformed in Grand Rapids, Second in Pala, Iowa. Sometimes the other churches in town resented the lax standards of these accepting churches, and they may also have been jealous of their growth. So I need to explore that question further. So if any of you know of churches like this or have had experience with them, I would love to hear your stories about that. It's interesting to think about how church people came to have a more open view on divorce. Um, did they see that divorce happened to even the most pious and spiritual couples in the church? Did they see that it happened to their grown children? Or did they realize that their own marriages may have been tenuous enough that divorce could happen to them too? What's striking to me is that the RCA did not engage in a lot of debate about this. Even though this required a radical shift in biblical interpretation, I mean, Jesus said, if you divorce and remarry, you commit adultery. That's explicit. And yet church members didn't seem to have, at least officially, much trouble accepting the reality of divorce and remarriage without a major conflict that threatened to divide the denomination. 
So it's interesting to me to think about why that could happen over divorce, but it can't happen over homosexuality. All right, so look at that for a little more detail if you're interested, look at the handout. So divorce among RCA women ministers. I've always been intrigued by what seems to be a higher number of RCA women clergy who are divorced than is the average. And I, that's kind of anecdotal. I just know a lot of people who've been divorced. So I need to get an accurate count on that. I did a survey, uh, which I sent to about 35 women, some questions about their experience with divorce. And I got about 15 responses. That's a decent response rate, but still a very small pool. So I realized my analysis is pretty limited. And I'm not sure my methodology would be fully approved by a social scientist, but it's a start. So when I started, I was thinking that most of these clergy women divorces would have been caused by the stresses of being a minister and the tensions on, on clergy marriage. And that proved to be somewhat true. Uh, but not surprisingly, um, the relationships that led to divorce were very complicated. So it's not just that the, the role was the problem, it's that they were just inherent troubles in marriages. So I have a few preliminary observations for you, drawn in part from the surveys and in part from more general reading about divorce. And I just want to say that when I try to diagnose these things, I mean absolutely no judgment by them. Um, things happen to people. Um, we grow up. We don't grow up. Um, you know, we make choices. So I'm just trying to uh, ob make some observations and not trying to make any moral judgments here. All right. So one of the first things that I see in this is that it is not easy to choose a marital partner, right? We do not always know ourselves or our partners as well as we think we do. We think that we are wise and mature and insightful at 18 or 21 or 25, but chances are we still have a lot of growing up to do. And then people change, they change a lot. So we discover feminism, for example. We learn that we are strong and capable and powerful. And our flaws also become more evident as we grow, whether we have addictive personalities, whether we like to avoid conflict, whether we can't really handle emotional intimacy, whatever the changes, they get to be in play more and more as we try to live together in marriage. A marriage may encounter a crisis, the loss of a child or infertility or financial problems, a child with special needs. The stress may weaken the bonds of marriage. Or one spouse who was moving in a relatively safe career direction decides to go to seminary. Romantic attraction in itself is a mystery to me. We are sometimes, I think, I, attracted to someone who meets a deep need in us or kind of fills a hole. So she likes to be needed. He needs help. They fit together perfectly like Lego blocks for a while. And then he starts to resent her help or she gets tired of helping. And you can find all kinds of other examples of these. For example, one needs approval, the other approves. I wonder if this is a particular issue for women clergy. Especially in the early years, it was such a struggle to gain approval. The fight to go to seminary, to be taken under care of a classes, to be ordained, to get respect, to get a job, to gain the congregation's trust, all of those things were just constantly hanging over people's heads. I have to earn approval. So if a potential partner seems supportive and accepting, that seems like a great fit. And it might be for a while or not. But I think there's a temptation often to, um, you know, to be drawn to a person who is accepting and gracious, which is not a bad thing. It's also possible that two people bond over their shared need. So if both are alcoholics or both have very different families, they might be drawn together, but then they're like Lego blocks that are going the opposite way. You know, they don't fit together because you got the prongs at each other, you got the open side at each other. So 
it's another interesting dynamic. And then I'm getting into things that are uh, therapeutic really more than historical and I'm getting a little out of my sandbox there. Um, premarital counseling seems to offer a place to work out these issues but it seems to me that once the venue is reserved and the dress is bought and the Pinterest is pinned it's pretty difficult to get at the deep relational issues. It would be great if we could all go into romantic relationships looking to identify the potential for the fit, you know, for seeing if there are potential unhealthy relationship patterns. But you don't necessarily want to ask on the fifth date, so tell me about your family dysfunction and how that's affected you, right? And even in apparently healthy families, there can be patterns that cause conflict. So a young woman grows up in a home where her father cooks and cleans and cares for children, but she marries a man whose father did not do those things. And conflict inevitably occurs there. It's not that either one is really wrong, it's just different. And people bring these expectations to marriage, uh, which then are challenging. So I wonder, how is it that pastors and congregations can help young people identify healthy relationships at an earlier age? I'm not trying to say that all relationships should be courting relationships or any of that. Uh, not all relationships need, need to be marriageable. But especially, how do we help young, younger people, college students, high school students, see warning signs in a relationship? How can they start to tell when a conflict might signify a bad fit and when conflicts are just the inevitable relational issues that need to be worked through? So I would think about, you know, doing, looking, watching movies, if there are any that deal realistically with marriage, romantic comedies, not so much, but how could we help people work through those kinds of questions? All right, a second thing that came up often in these uh, conversations, or the, the surveys from the women clergy, is just the issue of dual careers. So, this, the marriage statistics right now are suggesting that couples that have more education and marry later and have some financial stability are less likely to, work, to divorce. It's also true that fewer of those couples marry, so the divorce rates seem to be lower, but in parts it's because the marriage rates are lower in the first place. Now, clergy marriages have their own challenges, as many of you know. If Two spouses both have very demanding jobs, perhaps with a lot of travel, hours that far exceed nine to five, a lot of pressure to perform, and there are children. It can be difficult to manage jobs plus kids plus marriage. One person's career might be put on hold, or they may decide not to have children, or the marriage may be neglected. And that job pressure seems particularly difficult for ministers because it's not just that we have these jobs where we work all the time, as Damaris was just subject, suggesting. We are doing God's work, right? There are so many expectations. There's always more to do. We are dealing with people's souls. We must work more. And sometimes the work can feel more rewarding than the marriage. A related issue for clergy couples, I think, is sorting out a pathway where both spouses can have jobs that they like. So sometimes clergy move a lot, so there's pressure on the spouse to follow and to find a new job every time. Sometimes one spouse is rooted in one job in one place and the other spouse feels stuck and un unable to move to take a different job. So, those are some of the issues that have affected the divorces that have happened, just this tension between who moves where and when. And then the third and final aspect of this is just this question of what does it mean to be a married woman in ministry? Now you might think, why is this even an issue? Because male ministers have been married for almost 500 years and they haven't had to discuss this, you know, the problems of marriage. Um, but again, think about, the dynamics here. So a woman, especially in the 70s and 80s, when ordination was new and rare. So you have a young woman who's a high achiever at church. She's active in youth groups. She teaches Sunday school. She helps out. She's comfortable speaking. 
She is a good girl. She is a model young person. And maybe people encourage her to think about seminary ministry. Maybe she just comes to that herself in college. But then she may be a bit of a bad girl now because, well, she's not really supposed to be a minister yet. Again, this is in the older years. I think we're doing better. But um, this woman may marry a man who seems very outwardly supportive. He says he wants an egalitarian marriage. But he may have also grown up with very traditional parents. He may hear a voice in the back of his head, or he may hear a voice in his church or in the chapel program at his college that says, men are supposed to lead and women are supposed to follow. And then his wife or his girlfriend decides to go to seminary and becomes a pastor. And she's a very gifted leader and preacher. And her husband might feel a little threatened a little resentful. He may not even recognize that that's what's going on. The woman may in turn sense his resentment and try to make herself smaller and less public, but then she resents him too. So again, I think this dynamic shows up in various ways in marriages. It's not always the presenting problem, but it does uh, come up to some degree. Now, this is a very quick analysis of a complicated issue. Uh, my pastoral care pr professor at Princeton used to say that if she agreed to conduct the wedding of a clergy couple, she expected them to do nine months of premarital counseling. So that's a, that's a very high demand. Um, but it shows the complexity of the issues that clergy couples are going to have to work out. I've been reading a biography of Queen Victoria. Uh, so she's the queen, right? She's the ruler of the whole British Empire. But she also thought that she should obey her husband. Albert, her husband, was her subject, technically. But he thought he should be the one in charge of her money and much of her life. He wanted to share in her power. Uh, and Victoria refused that at first. But by the time she had her nine babies, each time Albert took on more royal responsibility. And at the end, he was very paternalistic about what he perceived as Victoria's lack of education and her need for guidance. So it's just been striking to me to be thinking about these divorce questions and reading about Victoria and Albert. If it was difficult for Albert to play second fiddle to the Queen of England, it can also be difficult for men to work through their wives or, or to think through what it means to be married to powerful, capable women. Uh, that might not be rational. It might, not, might seem hopelessly paternalistic, like grow up already, guys. But it's still a reality. It's how men have been shaped. And we've had centuries of thinking that men are in charge of everything, and it's not easy to navigate a shift. Uh, so one last point about this. Um, I think I said that the last one was the last one, but sorry. Um, marriage is hard. Um, so many of the movies we see romanticize relationships. So, you know, When Harry Met Sally or Sleepless in Seattle or so many other ones, a couple may have challenges getting to the altar, but once there, we see nothing about how they managed marriage. People can easily fall in love and feel a pull to this person and yet really not know how to do intimacy and connection. And then we all bring this baggage from our families and their families before them. We bring all our anxieties, um, all our issues about self-worth, um, that we're not good enough, that shame, all those kinds of things. Maybe we bring abuse to the table. We've been abused. Um, so given that, I'm amazed that marriages last 50 or 60 years. Um, if addiction or adultery or abuse is involved, marriage is even more complicated. So a lot of people get through those challenges, but many don't. And one of the questions seems to be, how do we know when? Um, these, some of these clergy women told powerful stories of working for years 
to overcome a spouse's um, addiction or issues, um, struggles of various sorts. And they worked and worked and prayed and sought counseling. And, um, and finally they said, it, it, it just, it was more destructive to stay married than it was to leave. And so made a choice to um, try to salvage what they could for their children, their own life, their spouse's life. Uh, but those are very difficult questions. So just some quick pastoral responses. What can the church do? Um, first of all, I think we can recognize that divorced people feel many different things. Failure, belief, betrayal, shock. Um, some people go through decades of marriage and then decide that they don't want to do it anymore. Um, they don't want to do the work of saving the marriage. Um, and so just to recognize in pastoral leadership that not everybody is a betrayed spouse. Um, not everybody is the betraying spouse. There's all kinds of complicated factors in marriage. That kind of sensitivity is helpful, I think. Um, I, I heard a pastoral prayer once where the pastor equated um, divorce with uh, widows and lost and lonely people as if you know all divorced people were kind of lost and lonely and broken and hurting and and again not necessarily um, some are some aren't so uh, that kind of sensitivity I think is helpful um, a second thing is just to recognize that marriage is not the only way to new life and happiness and here, if I can just make a quick personal reference, when my uh, my ex-husband got remarried, his um, Facebook page was just full of um, people congratulating him, which was wonderful. And, you know, all saying, well, congratulations on starting a new life. And this is so great. And this new life. And I thought, mm, well, what do I have? Do I have no life here? And so it was just an interesting dynamic. Um, so how do we again, affirm people, and this goes for all single people in the church, how do we affirm people um, who, aren't in, who aren't coupled? And how do we uh, make the church work for them in better ways? One woman said that when she was divorced, she found she didn't really fit in her large church with all kinds of groups. There was a group for um, you know, married couples that she'd been a part of, there was a group for older people, there was a group for divorced people, and she didn't really want to be part of a group of divorced people, and so she had a hard time finding where she fit. Um, so how can we offer space for people? Um, another question I think is how do we help people move on so that they're not defined by failure? Um, I think a related question is how do we help people move on so they don't just instantly jump into a new marriage in the next three months or something, which I think sometimes happens. Um, how can we find grace and growth in this process? So just a couple of examples of current events and then I'll wind up because I'm close to my time here. Elizabeth Berg has a novel out called Night of Miracles. And the book is about a woman named Iris who divorced her husband and moved away to a small town somewhere. And, you know, things happen and she meets people and she develops a kind of a sense of community. But at some point, after some self-reflection, she wrote her husband a letter and she asked him for forgiveness. And she said she did not want to get back into his life. And instead, she wanted to get him out of her life in the nicest possible way. She said in the letter that she hopes he is rich in love. And she must have had a little bit of a time saying that because even she had wanted a baby for her whole marriage and her husband refused. And now his new wife was pregnant. So again, for her to hope that he was rich in love was quite an act of grace on her part. And she later reflected that she had not had many friends during her marriage. She expected her husband to be everything to her when it was not his place to do that. She regretted having made him feel that he was failing her when she was the one failing herself. She found that she had now become a truer version of herself. 
Now, I offer that not because it's the diagnosis for everybody, it's very personal, but because it's an interesting example of somebody coming to terms with the reality of divorce and moving on and finding a new place in life and finding a kind of contentment uh, that is not demanding the presence of another person. And it's kind of releasing her and him from uh, the mistakes that they'd made while they were married. It's, a, it's an interesting model. Another example comes from Wendy Swallow in a memoir, memoir called Breaking Apart. And she noted that her friends were surprised that she and her ex-husband got along fairly well. And they said that we could never do that. And she said that most of the vocabulary about divorce emphasized brokenness and blame, especially the legal system. She said she tried to use the language of forgiveness and healing. And she observed, society is not particularly comfortable with the idea of a good divorce, a healthy divorce. On some level, divorce needs to remain a demon or too many of us would flee. That is a really powerful insight, I think. And so again, the church has not wanted to make divorce too easy. We don't want to seem like we're soft on divorce or soft on sin or whatever the language is. So we want to keep it a bad thing, but that leads the church to not really being very understanding about people struggling with marriage, not offering much help to them, uh, that sort of thing. If you've seen the Netflix movie, The Marriage Story, you've seen how destructive the adversarial approach to marriage can be. A couple is torn apart when the lawyers get involved and they have to fight over custody and distance and all of that. So I wonder, how might the church help people become more honest about the struggles of marriage? I suspect that a lot of people in the pews are keeping secrets because they think they're the only ones who are struggling. Is there a way to help people speak honestly about their marriage without shaming and blaming? Are there resources we can offer and tools we can give to people to figure out how to communicate better and how to navigate those tricky waters of intimacy and emotional connection? And then if divorce does happen, how can we help people move on? How can we help them not to be paralyzed by failure, but be realistic about how they each contributed to the problems in the marriage and to see how they can now move on into a, a hopeful future? So those are my honest reflections about divorce. And I invite your conversation either here or uh, you're welcome to email me if you have stories to tell, I would love to hear them. So I think James sent our email addresses and um, uh, please tell me your stories via email. Um, if you have people in your congregations who would like to tell a story, I would love to hear it. So. Um, Thank you for listening. I appreciate your patience with this awkward venue. So uh, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, this is the part, imagine us all wildly applauding for you because we, we <laughs> right. at least politely applaud where we in Mass Chapel. Um, let's see, um, we've, we are starting to get some folks queuing up for questions. Um, Leah Ennis. Am I on now? <clears throat> Sorry, I have a little seasonal cold. Um, I just want to say, first of all, I, I mean, I don't mind saying this because I submitted some to answer some of your questions. So I really appreciate having the space to do that. Um, so I, 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 I thank you. Um, but I also would just want to know a little bit more about your process um, in, in the, the overall picture, if you have an overall picture at this point. No, it's a good question. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I've submitted a couple of book proposals and not nobody's bitten, um, which is interesting to me because people say, um, you know, my Pope Westminster, John Knox, has said, nah, we were not really interested. And Fortress said, nah, we don't think anybody cares about that. But there is not much in the way of like mainline literature about divorce. Right. Um, the best book I've found is Randy Nichols, um, Ending Marriage, Keeping Faith, which was published in 1991. 
Um, there's all kinds of conservative stuff out there about fixing your marriage. You know, you can fix your marriage no matter how bad it is. So I've been thinking about a book, but I'm not sure what shape that would take at this point. Um, so I've got this sabbatical in the in the fall and then a course release in the spring to try to figure out what I'm going to do with it. I'm hoping to survey some more um, church members to look at how they've experienced both divorce and the church's reaction to it. So if you've got suggestions, I would love to hear them. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Joanne V is up next. Was she just being thankful or was she asking a question? I don't know. I thought maybe <laughs> her name was there. Oh, she's just being thankful. Oh. <laughs> she doesn't need to, nobody needs to apologize for being thankful. That's for sure. And none of us need to apologize for being awkward with the technology today because we're all awkward with the technology. Right. Today. Um, anybody else have a question, a comment for Lynn? Anybody just have a story that you want to tell? If not about yourself, what, what do you remember about how divorced people were treated in the church in your childhood, for example? Does if, ah. Uh, That's okay. Liz Testa. Lynn, thanks so much. It's, Thank um, it's really encouraging to hear you uh, sharing your wisdom um, and your experience with us. And, you know, our part of our ministry is this thing called honoring our stories. And so your encouragement for people to share their stories, there's so much healing that can happen in that. And then also this whole notion of being connected but then, you know, women that have felt like they were the only ones or that have carried that that secret shame or guilt or not so secret, right? It's very, it can be very public. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to name that um, in terms of kind of a, a, a high, kind of a, a high level story, if you will, of like that's that's something that for us in our work with women's transformation and leadership, we know that that's it's important that we that we expose that um, with the small e, you know, in in the more pastoral way. And then just just to name that, as we've done this honoring our stories work, um, and and we've invited women to to share, we hear over and over again that both andness of how the church might respond to women who are divorced. And so I just wanted to say that um, I'm so encouraged to hear how you're so well, like so wisely articulating, like you're you're articulating this this very real thing for many women that they, you know, they had the, the marriage broke and the husband was the one that was cared for or the one that was able to go off and have the new life. And the, 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 the wife, the woman was left with children. Mm -hmm. um, I hear many stories about women that did not have a job, you know, were staying at home. Right. And so then there they were and that they really, um, they really were at a loss of how to rebuild their lives. And right. there's equal measure of stories of women who were cared for then by the church. And those right. are so full of hope. And those I think are so important. And then there were equal measure of, of and not even from what we would think of as like super conservative churches, mm -hmm. but where people just, you know, I, I would say very much in, um, let, me, let me also say, I've heard it mostly of women not being taken care of or supported directly comes from more of our uh, very highly westernized uh, Anglo or Dutch, you know, Northern, Northern European churches mm -hmm. where there just was this awkwardness, right. Mm -hmm. um, of of right. how do we even approach it? And mm -hmm. so kind of that very um, American independent uh, mm -hmm. thing. Right. And so then also to enter into more of kind of the, the global perspective, um, certainly, uh, I know in the African American churches and in in Latin churches, there's there's circumstances where there is sometimes um, trouble with that. But then, because of the communal nature, I would say of those cultures, there can also be um, a real drawing in 
Mm -hmm. and supporting of. Mm -hmm. And so I think too, to just uh, be aware of kind of the cultural mm -hmm. norms and differences and even right. within the, within, we even culture within culture. Mm -hmm. so I don't want to over, over stigmatize mm -hmm. that, but right. just from my right. experiences in New York City churches and with New York City women, I mean, at my former church, I served for 12 years at Marble Collegiate. We would never anticipate that any woman was married. We would never anticipate that she had children mm -hmm. um, or not have children, or if she did have children, that there was a spouse on the scene. Mm -hmm. And right. so, so again, like um, you know, we would we would let them come and share their stories as they so chose to, and and do our very best not to carry judgment with that, but just mm -hmm. to meet them where they where they where they were, where they are, and, uh -huh. and tend the flock. Uh -huh. So. So I guess just to say that there's there's an interesting thing there to to explore and certainly within the RCA mm -hmm. as you're doing your right. work again for the broader church of how uh -huh. does, how how to race and culture and um, I mean class of course as well but in terms of like a, a, a racial ethnic diversity cultural diversity piece uh -huh. yeah this is a great question cultures address so mm -hmm. good thank Thanks you so much so much so much richness there. <laughs> We're gonna pray. I I would like to direct my prayers to to a book uh, a book publisher picking this up because it's really <laughs> well. That's people have said that, so we'll see. Okay, Sally Ann has a has a story to share. Hi. So um, I was traveling, I was taking my mom, my mom's, uh, I don't think she was 90 yet, she was probably 89 at the at that point, but uh, we decided to take the train across Canada. So we boarded the train on the east side and we were going all the way across to Vancouver. And um, this was something that she and my dad had wanted to do and never got to do, so, uh, so we were doing this. So there were a lot of people on this train. It was uh, some kind of big um, national celebration, uh, centennial or something or other was going on. There were tons of people on the train. But um, they had a dinner meal seating and every time you were seated at a table, they deliberately tried to put you with someone else. So one of the early meals, we were seated with two women who were traveling together. And uh, the usual, what do you do? What do you do? And um, I had just been ordained. So, and my mother was quite proud of this. So she told these two women that I was uh, a minister. And they were both so very happy about this to see a woman minister. And they were part of a large group traveling to a conference, a denominational conference for the Uniting Church of Canada that was taking place in Vancouver. And they were just so thrilled that there was a woman minister <laughs> until they asked me about my husband. And when I said I was divorced, it was like the world stopped. And these were women. And they just looked at me and I could tell they were horrified. And, and I was reading into their uh, countenance that they thought I shouldn't have been ordained if I was divorced. And then they avoided us for the rest of the trip. Hmm. Interesting. Somebody said recently in a in a survey that um, she felt like she was joining this group of of divorced women clergy that there were so many of them and that they tended to get stuck in the small churches and that sort of thing. So uh, that that deserves some more explanation. You know, is there something about? I mean, are we a particularly cranky? dysfunctional bunch that makes us get more likely to get divorced? I don't think so. Um, I've also seen a lot of people get divorced and then become very happily remarried. And others who just say, I have no need to get remarried. So, th but that's a really interesting dynamic that, that the divorce problem would kind of trump their joy over your being ordained. That's so intriguing. Did they give you any sense of what was going on there? Like, did they just think divorce was really bad? I mean, the United Church of Canada is pretty progressive. Well, I was, 
I was stunned, actually, because I never thought of divorce as a stigma. Um, and I have to say that it's one of those vignettes that you carry in your brain and right. I revisit it often. Uh -huh. And I can't believe that these were women so, so upset about divorced clergy. Uh huh. And that seemed right. to be what it was. And they really didn't define it other than by shutting down and avoiding. Uh -huh. Huh. We never ate another meal with them again. Right. Okay. Interesting. Huh. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Mary Cansfield, you say something about comment on 1843 RCA's struggle with the marriage question. Yes, but Mary comes next. Mary comes second. There's somebody. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Claudette wants us, wanted to ask, do you see different patterns among yo younger or older divorced clergy? Mm -hmm. um, I would say I haven't done enough work on that. I don't have enough younger clergy women in the sample yet to really say that. Um, one that I talked to at some length, um, her husband had decided kind of abruptly that he wanted a divorce. So. Uh, sort of a different situation than some of the other older women clergy. But again, I just, I don't know enough to identify patterns in that yet, but I will, I will kind of try to keep track of that. Great question. Okay. Now Mary's up. You can ask, you can answer Mary's. Oh, um, I didn't know what she meant by eight, the 1843 struggle. Is she on? Maybe okay. not. First, Lynn, what a wonderful presentation this is and how much this stimulus this provides for our thinking and thinking together. Thank so you. congratulations to you uh, and uh, to James uh, for making the, this time together possible in light of the pandemic. In the church today, in 2020, uh, there is, of course, a great deal of conversation regarding same-sex marriage. And we think that it is the issue uh, for the first time that is tearing the church apart, when in fact, historically, this is not the case. Beginning, oh, in... Uh, early 18th century uh, in the university in Leiden, there began conversations uh, that grew and grew and grew until you get to the turn of the 19th century, the 1820s, and the question that began to tear churches apart, families apart, was this question. Can a man marry his deceased wife's sister? It tore more churches apart than the issue of slavery. Um, it was incredible. And uh, in preparation for your presentation today, I looked in Corwin's digest of synodical legislation. To, to see that it wasn't until 1843 that the General Synod rescinded all resolutions that forbid a man to marry his deceased wife's sister. So marriage and who won marriage has played a major role in the history of the RCA for a very long time. I, you know, I know of that, but I really don't know the details and I haven't gotten into the 19th century so much, but I will note that as something that I need to follow up on some more. That's fascinating. Well, in, in Corwin's Digest, there's a whole section. Okay. <laughs> under incest. Oh. That's where. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Crazy, huh? Huh. Yeah. 
But it's interesting that there, there was kind of a synod-wide statement about it. Um, you know, there was a rule that synod had made and synod could unmake the rule, um, which sort of counters my other argument from the 1949 discussion that synod shouldn't be meddling in uh, marriage issues. Interesting. Well, I would think I would think that um, a, as with modern synods, historic synods have contradicted one another. Right, exactly. And they have they have a unique way of forgetting exactly what the limits of their authority are, or that they have limits to their authority. Right, that's a good point. So that may not be a big thing. Um, there are other comments in the in the um, chat, but nothing that looks like. It was looking for a response. If somebody thought they were going to, they wanted to, um, they wanted Lynn to respond to something they said in the chat, they should um, quick type in their name right now so that I know that I'm wrong. Won't be the first time. Okay, seeing, seeing nothing there. Thank you again, Lynn. Thank you for listening. And we move on. Irma Williams is an elder and the vice president of the consistory at DeWitt Reformed Church in New York and serves as director of social services at Barrier Free Living Apartments located in the Bronx. Barrier Free Living is dedicated to helping New Yorkers with disabilities live independently in the community and provides a range of services and linkages to other community resources, enabling individuals to overcome the obstacles that stand in the way of living dignified, secure lives. Irma is here to talk to us about the courage to be honest about domestic violence. Thank you so much, James, uh, Reverend Liz Testa, Reverend James, thank you for having me on this forum to pull back the curtain on domestic violence in the church. Um, one of the things that I believe happens is that it's not talked about enough. Um, in 2017, at DeWitt, uh, we hosted a forum, a symposium on domestic violence. And uh, when it was presented to the church, it was something that, you know, is really, I, I was taken aback because it's something that we really don't discuss as much. And the, the importance of having that discussion and having that resource for us, you know. So it, it's, it's, it's important for us to, to bring awareness. And so thank you for having this, this forum to talk about domestic violence um, in our communities. I think that um, in the interest of having this discussion, because it's something that is new and I really thank the women's uh, transformation and uh, commit, uh, movement is that we, we bring this to the forefront. I believe that um, it is not enough uh, to just talk about. It's a, it's a conversation that continues to happen. Um, I am, um, my, my name is Anna Williams. I'm from Puerto Barrios, Guatemala, and my native language is from, is Spanish. Um, in addition to um, all the conditions in my homeland, poverty, economy, uh, we were propelled as a family to migrate to the United States of America. Um, I remember as early on as five years old, it, it, it's violence and something that that is surrounds us in our community and is accepted, especially between men and women. And I think that um, is normalized in our society. And it's something that is not talked about enough. Um, I think that uh, being, being from uh, a country where um, it's, it's just, right now it's not, it's torn apart. Um, it's not something that we bring to the forefront. I remember that um, the burdens and the circumstances that we ask God to help us with is, is something that 
that brings to mind one of my favorite stanzas that can be found in Psalm 34, 17, and 18 that says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. My spirit has been crushed, and it's God's people and God who helped us through our journey. It brings the passion the people that we serve who are either in a domestic violence situation or survivors of domestic violence. Oftentimes, we associate honesty with always being truthful and don't lie, be honest. Uh, but it's more than that. Sometimes the issues we need to deal with are so horrific, uh, we are unable to be to, to be honest about it uh, because it requires to look within ourselves and to be honest to see where you find yourself. It's debilitating because the enemy has done such a good job in tearing you down. You don't see God made you wonderfully. I, want, I just want to highlight what is domestic violence. Domestic violence is a pattern, of course, of behavior perpetrated by one person against an adult intimate and interpersonal partner with the goal of establishing power and control. Domestic violence occurs in all kinds of intimate relationships, including married couples with or without children, people who are dating, people with children in common, same-sex partners, couples who lives together and teen dating relationships. It is important to be non-judgmental when working with the people we serve as much as we may want them to leave the relationship. It is important to meet them where they are and build rapport and empowerment. Oftentimes, uh, women in the church are silent where they don't want to speak about what is going on in their homes. Primarily, either there are clergy or there are elders or deacons in the church or just um, uh, mothers and, 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 and wives. They do not want to share the honesty of what's happening in their homes. And in this time uh, of the coronavirus, I think that it's so important to highlight and check in on people because we believe that our homes is our sanctuary. But most often, right now in this time and climate, we 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 have to consider those who whose home is not a sanctuary. And right now, because of we have we're quarantined, you we find people who are trapped in their apartments. It's a jail. It's a, it's a it's a trap. It's just somewhere they, they, there's nowhere to go, and it makes it so much difficult. At least if the if we have churches and we have. Um, gatherings and, and, and places that they can go, at least for a moment or for a few hours, they can leave the home. But right now, it's, that's not the case. The cases is where we think that it's a sanctuary. It's not for some, for some people. I truly believe that removing barriers will encourage a traumatized person to begin to tell their truth. I spoke of trauma that is buried uh, uh, with with people who grow up in violent situations in violent homes and and it's a normal situation for them and we don't know how that translates and as I, I was listening to Mr. Pinger talk about um, being married and being in a relationship and being uh, what the church says about marriage that you're supposed to stay together. I listened to um, the story, the vignette that was, uh, although she was uh, the happiest time of her life, where she was um, uh, just ordained a minister, but when uh, the minute she said that she was divorced, that took another different tone. So I think that trauma, we carry trauma with us in our lives and we look at, at things differently and look at the world differently and it happens to affect us. So when we are choosing relationships, we oftentimes choose unhealthy relationships. And in order for us to be able to begin to, to, to pull the curtain from domestic violence, this is a great forum to continue to be talking about. Courage. The courage to be honest for a domestic violence uh, survivor, it, it, it takes time. Courage doesn't always come when a person leaves a relationship. Courage, they don't, they don't know that they are being courageous. Uh, it's just a matter of survival. Um, 
in order to get out of the situation. They don't look at it as courage. As service providers, we tend to do an intake and we have to ask pertinent questions. That's when a person gets a chance to answer the questions as honestly as they can. This is between the interviewee and the interviewer. Speaking out loud and hearing yourself speak your truth is the most scariest time of your life. In the rooms, we say that the, the first step is to admit that you're powerless, vulnerable, hurt, uh, lost everything, conflicted, because you still love this person that's hurting you, right? Over time, you develop your testimony, your story, so that you can speak it loud enough that to not only you, but to a group or to someone else, so that you'll be able to to stand on a platform so that you can say this happened to you. But it's, it's still stigmatized that domestic violence is something that we do not readily hear someone talking about. Uh, it's something that is kept a secret. Um, you have experienced domestic violence and still, right, people blame you for staying. Um, it's, it's highly uh, happens so often that why didn't she stay? Why she didn't leave the relationship? Why um, she, uh, she must like it? You know, these are some of the things that we hear people say, uh, especially uh, when, when you are a person who loves God uh, and God knows that what you're going through. Um, and, and, and you know that God is a just God and God is, 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 is against injustices that happens to us. Um, as time goes by, you begin to speak life into your life as you allow the light of Jesus to enter into your world. I want to talk to you more about how domestic violence affects people with disabilities because that's one of the um, um, areas of where I, I most focus on. Uh, I, I'm not trying to say that uh, domestic violence that affects other people uh, is less important, but I just want to highlight those who are disabled. Um, anyone can be affected by DV and abuse, and I'm not making light of that. People with disabilities challenges are unique due to the barrier to access and support. These women are often isolated, vulnerable, are disadvantage, lack of accessibility, limited resources, structural limitations, lack of transportation. Some disabled lack the skills or abilities necessary to act independently, uh, to seek help. You and I take it for granted that when something is happening to us, we know where to go, we know to Google, we know how, you know what to do. But when you are having some disabilities, it's difficult to access services and to act independently because you may have to depend on somebody to help you with these things. Some disabled lack the skills or abilities necessary to seek help. Many disabled lack knowledge about services. Public information and awareness education are generally not distributed in braille, uh, large print, or audio tape and do not define domestic violence in ways that people with disabilities can relate to. Disabled victims of DV are heavily dependent on their abusive primary caregiver and run the risk of losing their caretaker if they report their abuse. Victims risk being institutionalized or losing basic decision-making rights. The risk, they risk losing custody of their children. Sometimes some, some disabilities, you don't really, they're not visible. Uh, we have individuals who are intellectually disabled that they may have other medical or, or mental health uh, situations that you really don't see. There is so much to consider. So if being honest and telling the truth, then what? Then what do we do? We have different types of abuse. You have physical, sexual, emotional, psychological, social, environmental abuse. According to the National uh, Coalition Against Domestic Violence, did you know that women with disabilities had a 40% greater risk of violence than women without disabilities? Did you know that women with disabilities are at particular risk for severe violence? Did you know that the most common perpetrator of violence against women with disabilities are their male partners? Studies estimate that 80% of disabled women have been sexually assaulted 
women with disabilities are three times more likely to be sexually assaulted than women with disabilities, without disabilities. One study showed that 47% of sexually abused women with disabilities report assaults on more than 10 occasions. Approximately 48% of substantiated cases of abuse involve elder adults who are not physically able to care for themselves. Disabled children are more, like, more than twice as likely as children without disabilities to be physically abused and almost twice as likely to be sexually abused. Virtually all women with disabilities who were sexually assaulted are reported social, emotional, and behavioral harm. The challenge is because DV is about power and control, to maintain control, these are some of the experiences. They may have their medications intentionally withheld or overdosed, experience financial abuse and extortion, receive threats of abandonment, experience inappropriate sexual touching during baths and dressing, have access to adaptive equipment, restricted or taken away, such like a walker or a wheelchair or a button that to call for help, uh, have communication or mobility devices taken away, like I stated, have their service animals threatened or harmed, have caretakers intentionally ignore personal care and hygiene. Survivors have barriers to seek support from outside sources, including isolation, which is such as the case right now. And it's so important for us to check on, on us, our shut-ins right now, especially our elders, um, uh, our senior citizens. Check in on them. Check in on their caretakers, uh, home attendants, or whoever is taking care of them because this is, a, this is a real situation. This, and I find oftentimes that our elders are being abused more and more. Uh, lack of communication devices, like their hearing aids are taken away, um, and um, interpretation services are not being provided for them. The lack of transportation, lack of privacy, um, uh, our, our elders are so stupid for being private. They don't want to tell anything or say anything or whatever happens, happens, you know, because this is a cultural situation. This is something that we do. Where it happens in your home, stays in your home. That's the, that's the, um, the uh, population that we serve. Uh, Community spaces that are architecturally inaccessible. Um, when we go to, uh, we we have a uh, an initiative that we go around the neighborhood to look identify places what that should have access, and we report it. We have a list that we report it to the uh, office of disabilities, um, like Popeyes or somewhere uh, the, the the post office in the neighborhood or or somewhere that that we we could pay we notice that there is not accessibility for people who are disabled. We report it. A societal attitudes, but attitudes about people who are disabled um, has to change. It takes courage to live under these circumstances and overcoming their disabilities. And to God be the glory when we do find courage, to be honest. I have heard some these scriptures being referred to. One of the scriptures is coming out of Deuteronomy 3, 31 and 6, which stated, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And another scripture stays with me, Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I will be with you a little bit longer. Please forgive me if I start coughing. Um, I have a little scratchy, scratchiness. Uh, so I like feel it coming on already, so I'm going to try to move along. Uh, we have support systems in place that uh, we can refer our members of the church if they continue to, if they open up 
just to let us know what's going on. Uh, we have friends and families, you know, there's communities. Uh, and right now, I, I, again, I cannot stress enough, these communities and these places are not open, senior citizen centers are not open right now. All agencies are not open right now. We have domestic violence services, legal options that people can access. Uh, at the uh, where I work at Barrenfield Living, we have three ways we can help. We um, have uh, a domestic violence shelter where people can go when they have the courage to leave the relationship, um, and they can stay for for up to 180 days. And after that, um, they could go to another facility where it's called Secret Garden and it offers counseling and you just have a partners that they, they and their families can stay for up to six months. And after where I work is a call barrier free living apartments where we have two buildings where we house single individuals, uh, 70 units, and we have a family building where it has 50 units that uh, provides the services for 50 women and about 93 children. And these are begin to provide supportive services to the New York, New York one population A and G uh, supportive housing uh, stipulations. We have a, the story of a vignette of a survivor um, that went through these three facilities. Um, and now she's, they, they sit on the board, on the Barrier Free Living board, um, where she escaped her abuser and she sought, sought help. And she, she says that she grew up in, a, in an unhealthy environment, never had a good enough mother. She was abused as a child in every form. And she knows that it, it to be she knows what it's like to be hurt in life. She was a survivor. And in 2009, she decided that she had enough, living with her abusive, in her abusive relationship with her children's father. And she picked up the phone and she went to the shelter. She went into Freedom House with her children and she was greeted with respect and empathy. And this is one of the things that whenever a person flees their abusive relationship, it's important to provide um, a safe haven for them. And I think that the Reformed Church is supposed to be a safe haven for people who are experiencing abuse, but it's something often not talked about enough and not um, provided the, the resources. You know, I know we do have, I looked on online and I, and I see there are some sermons and there are some things that I lose to domestic violence um, awareness, um, but I think we we need to we need to in, in improve more and talk about it more and provide more resources and more um, um, safe places that people can come and and share and know that they will be heard and um, accepted and, and 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 assisted. This young woman, she moved from Freedom House, and she now she is um, uh, living in her own apartment with her children and raising her children. And she became an avid advocate for domestic violence with people with disabilities. And now she sits on the board and to provide input um, around um, domestic violence. Oftentimes we blame ourselves, uh, people who are abused, we blame ourselves for the bad things that happen to them, um, and it's neither their fault. Um, and I think that, that that's something that we could probably look at as a church to, to remove the blame and, and continue to preach God's word and life and love into the lives of individuals who can feel good enough to say, you know, elder or deacon or pastor or sister or some, something to come and say, I just, I'm having a difficult time at home. Uh, clergy, you know, um, I, I cannot stress enough that it's so, if you cannot talk about the wolf, you definitely cannot talk about domestic violence because as women in, our, in, in leadership positions, we, we tend to be, we are held to a different standard. 
um, than than everyone else. And and it, it, when we we look around, we see that a lot. Uh, Cause uh, the blame and, and feeling guilty about it, it, it lowers our self-esteem and it can get in the way of the healing and recovery. Um, it's not your fault. These are the things that we can continue to say. I and mean, we can preach from the pulpit, you know, that a lot of times we just have to include these situations so that a person can say, you know, my church is really talking about this. And it seems like this is something that I'm going through and, and just, just continue to use the word of God to encourage people who are dealing with these situations right now. And we just have to accept it. Um, acceptance, um, sometimes you feel as though you're stuck. Um, you can't do things that you want to do with your life because of memories. Uh, PTSD is definitely something that we face. Uh, when we are providing services to people who are experiencing domestic violence, and it shows up in so many different ways, as well as uh, traumatic brain injury, TBI. Um, you'll be surprised how that manifests. In, in a person's lives, and you look around in our churches, and we, we see people who behave a certain way, and we don't understand why. Um, I, you start to look at the symptoms and the, the um, adverse effect of traumatic brain injury, and how it affects a person's behavior, uh, a person's thinking. Um, and we, we, it's something that I'm exploring more now that I'm at home. Um, not being um, quarantined, of course, um, but it's something I'm seeking books to um, read about traumatic brain injury and how that affects an individual, you know, symptoms and thoughts, you know, um, feelings and, and, and the, of depression and, and how does affect, how does that translate to the children uh, that, are, um, that are affected? I, I, we have 50 women in my in the family building and 93 children and one of the things that I do, I, I go into the learning center and I, and I observe the children and, and how they are and how they are behaving because it gives me an insight of what's happening in their homes because children mimic what we do or they see what we do. So I, I encourage uh, when we are in church and we're looking around and we pay attention to the children uh, and they will, they will, without the parent or anyone say this is happening in my home, pretty much if you look at the children and how they behave, uh, they're mimicking what's going on, how they play, interact with their toys, how they interact with one another. Um, this is something that they see happening in their home. So it, it, it is something that we can look at. You may feel as though you're losing your whole life uh, because of abuse. Create I statements that you can affirm your self value and tell your I story. Uh, the courage to be honest is just that. Telling your story, telling your story, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much. I, I wanted to. I know you probably heard this story and this this poem, and I always have to end with this uh, poem because um, it's so deep and it's so. Um, it's heartening, and it's, 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 an, it's an anonymous poem, and like you probably heard it before, I Got Flowers Today, and it's dedicated to battered women. I got flowers today. It wasn't my birthday or any other special day. We had our first argument last night, and he said a lot of cruel things. That really hurts. I know that he is sorry, and he didn't need to say these things because he sent me flowers today. I got flowers today. It wasn't our anniversary or any other special day. Last night, he threw me into a wall and started to choke me. It seemed like a nightmare. I couldn't believe that it was real. I woke up this morning sore and bruised all over. I know he must be sorry because he sent me flowers today. I got flowers today, and it wasn't Valentine's Day and any other special day. Last night, he beat me and threatened to kill me. Makeup and long sleeves didn't hide the cuts and bruises this time. 
I couldn't go to work today because I didn't want anyone to know. But I know he's sorry because he sent me flowers today. I got flowers today, and it wasn't Mother's Day or any other special day. Last night he beat me again, and it was worse than all the other times. If I lose him, what will I do? How will I take care of my kids? What about money? I'm afraid of him, but I'm too scared and dependent to leave him. But he must be sorry because he sent me flowers today. I got flowers today. Today was a special day. It was the day of my funeral. Last night he killed me. If only I would have gathered the courage and strength to leave him. I could have received help from the women's shelter, but I didn't ask for help. So I got flowers today for the last time. Thank you. Thank you, Burma. Um, we've got time for just a couple of questions. I know Bianca Williams has a question. I don't know if she wants to ask it herself, but if not, I will ask it. Not hearing anything, I will go ahead. Um, Bianca asks, what was the reaction? Hang on a second. Um, what was the reaction or impact on the church when you held the domestic violence symposium? How do you think the church can be more proactive? I think that um, I think we, we need to do more symposiums to educate the community about domestic violence because I wanted to do the clothesline project, but before we do that, we have to do more education, more um, resources, more um, forums, more um, symposiums in order for us to bring the police department and everybody else that works in the domestic violence uh, field to educate our, our churches and our communities in order for them to feel empowered to, to come forth and, and speak their truth. But the church was receptive for it, and I think we have to continue to do it because it's, it's, it's not talked about enough. Okay. I hope that helps. Um, Liz Testa also has a question, um, and she's had to um, step out because she's also taking part in a meeting in California. Um, so her, her, she, she says, you mentioned your population having a mentality that these things happen inside the home and don't get shared with others. Yeah. Say more about this for those who may not have experience with the ones whom you serve. Well, I mean, this is an overall issue. Um, it's not just because I, I work with a, po a population that already sought help. Um, either by going to a shelter, going to a, a, a program, or living in a domestic violence um, apartment, uh, an apartment that, that um, provides services to domestic violence is really an awareness. I'm talking about the people who, like Liz, Reverend Liz says, that really don't know that there are um, services for them. And one of the things that I find is that and even in, in, in our churches, that there are individuals who do share what they've been through, but they don't re they're not readily ready to open up to talk about their circumstances. Um, I think that by, by hosting these kind of forums and talking about domestic violence and also opening up the church to talk about and have events and, 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 and um, programs that address uh, domestic violence, I think that's a start. And this is a great start to kicking down the doors and barriers that people face. Oh yeah, I can't hear you. I lost you a little bit. Yep, there, here I am, here I am. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Irma, for, for your sharing. Thank you, Reverend Brown, and thank you for having me. Oh, glad you could be here. Our next presenter is Pamela Pater Ennis. Pam is Executive Director of Hudson River Care and Counseling in Hudson and Bergen Counties in New Jersey and an adjunct faculty member in Pastoral Care and Counseling at New Brunswick. Um, she will talk about the need for self-care in the area of mental health, especially for those who are in vocational ministry and but point to avenues for all of us to be able to find help. So we welcome Pam. Thank you, everyone. Um, 
I, I'm just, I'm going to just start like you did, Irma. And again, so far, I have a, a big act to follow here with all of you. But um, a, lot of these, <clears throat> a lot of these issues are near and dear to issues I've worked with <clears throat> within my counseling and within the church over the years. So I hope we have more opportunities to have discussions like this down the road. That's a hint, James, right? <clears throat> and Liz. But I'm going to just, I put these on the back of my PowerPoint if you're seeing them, but I'm going to start with the scripture since that seems pertinent. And the theme, of course, of having courage is that so often, like the women in domestic violence or um, the women who, or men, anyone in the church who has mental health issues, often, and I have to say it's gotten a lot better, often don't come forward to get help for, and I can say more about that in a minute. But I'm always struck by the narratives about healing uh, and women in the Bible. And I, I, I didn't include this one, but it's uh, one of my favorites in Mark 5, verse 28. It's about the women with the issue of blood or the hemorrhaging woman, depending on your translation. And, she, and, she, and just the verse that jumped out at me is, for she thought, as Jesus was coming to the crowd, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Now, in context, that was incredibly courageous because that was a woman, an Orthodox woman, who would, number one, never been out if she was hemorrhaging or having an issue of blood or having her period or whatever it was that she'd had for 12 years. And secondly, a woman would not have been out amongst, um, Orthodox women would not have been out amongst men like that, let alone touch him, women cannot touch men uh, that are whom they are not married to in orthodox circles. And then the one, the two that I put on, on the PowerPoint was the, one of my other favorites and people always tease me. This is the only thing I preach on. In fact, John four with a Samaritan woman, the woman at the well and verse 15, you know, the story where Jesus has come with disciples through Samaria. She's a woman who we find out later has been married, what, five times, and then currently not with her husband. She's sitting at the well, the well of Jacob, and this incredibly historically significant place. And, and Jesus is talking to her all along, presumably knowing exactly what struggle she's had. We don't know whether, she, this was last week's lectionary, right? We don't know whether they've died or she's, or, or she, they've divorced her, but nonetheless, she's, she's had five marriages and now it's someone else. And she says to Jesus, sir, he's talking to her about this water and metaphor, sir, give me this water, this living water, as he says, or this quickening water, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water because it's the heat of the day, it's the middle of the day, it's hot. And women, again, Samaritan women when associated with men, let alone women. So another instance of courage to be there in the middle of the day and to be sitting with a man and to ask him and take him up on his offer of living water. And then finally, Luke 17 is about the leper story in verse 19. This is a story about men, but again, men need courage too to seek their mental health. And Jesus says to the leper, stand up, get up, go on your way. Your faith has healed you and saved you. So I want to really just talk about what is healing. What is healing? Healing sometimes isn't, uh, which I guess is interesting in light of this coronavirus, like what is healing going to be here for our country, our world, for the people with the diseases, perhaps for the families that lose somebody. Healing might be not a cure, but healing may be coming to terms with things or, or adjusting to a new normal, which I imagine the, all these situations had to do too, the Samaritan woman and, and the hemorrhaging woman, even though they were healed, they had to adjust a whole different way of life to adjust and heal. So I did focus this on clergy, although I think a lot of what I have to say, other than my case studies, is really true of all people struggling with mental health. And it, and there are, and I didn't address, I can address this a little bit, but there are cultural variations, of course, too, um, which I can also speak to. Um, I'm going to focus on the clergy piece, but again, I think, keep in mind that this is really for everyone. Clergy who do not have the courage to seek out mental health care are at risk for um, mental health issues, substance abuse issues, 
financial malfeasance and acting out sexually, um, whether it be with children or with other adult partners, um, people in their congregations usually, or having, so I want to just put that out there and I can say more about each of these. First of all, I just, and we're all, I think in this mode right now to really just do some definitions here. This is not my, my research, um, this is just a lit review. And the terms we see battered around are compassion fatigue and burnout. Um, they're really, I think, interchangeable, although I think burnout's the bigger issue. Compassion fatigue may be in the smaller of the burnout. So I'll just take a moment, some moments. You have these on your PowerPoints, but just to, if you're not looking right at it, don't worry. Um, compassion fatigue, and gosh, this is so timely, right? God has a way of always pulling these things together. Compassion fatigue can affect anyone in the health and profession or people in general, I think, as as you said, are people living in households now with trying to homeschool, take care of handicapped people, take care of their own families and work all at home. It's just even without domestic violence, it's right for stress. Um, and perhaps escalation and other issues, whether it be marital problems or domestic violence or substance abuse. So we all are probably going to be dealing with compassion fatigue in a bit here, if not burnout. Compassion fatigue can affect anyone in the health profession, as I said. I, for example, clergy, nurses, teachers, counselors, social workers. It leads to fatigue. Probably we're all feeling perfectly normal right now. Fatigue, I know I am. Mild feelings of anxiety, depression insomnia um and burnout is the greater sum of that really where it goes on and on and on for months um if not years burnout is the aspect of compassion fatigue that is really characterized by true depression anxiety brought about by usually the workplace environment um disconnectedness which is interesting we're talking about being very connected but being disconnected it's sort of an interesting paradox Um, compassion fatigue really is associated with high expectations from members. This is, um, and we talked about this, Lynn, you talked about this, um, and, uh, we, we talked about, and on um, just about certainly true of clergy, but other uh, helping professions too. Uh, expectations from members, people around us with minimal training sometimes in mental health practice. And I know when I do teach, um, at the seminary and I teach pastoral care courses, I, I'm forever saying to them, these are things you can do in pastoral counseling, um, but try not to get over your head and seek help. Always develop collaborative relationships with local mental health professionals, particularly maybe someone who has a faith-based perspective because you don't have the training and you can't expect to be able to do long-term marriage counseling, for instance, or know how to deal with trauma, or know how to deal with disability services. Always be the pastor. Always offer your services, but don't try to do it all on your own. Develop a working relationship where you have open, signed releases and can talk back and forth about your parishioner's needs. Um, and then, so therefore, if you're trying to do that and you don't go to, and I would also suggest that clergy, all clergy should probably either have a spiritual director and a therapist or both, ideally, or be in a clergy group. I'm going to say more about that in a minute too. But so the manifestation of compassion fatigue occurs when, again, we get, we just can't handle all that's demanded and all the work you do with your people in the community, especially a high needs community like urban living or people maybe in a refugee community, people where the demands are extremely high or, or after a crisis such as this. And then compassion fatigue is, is again, really the, the greater sum of that. Um, and then if not treated, that's where it, it can lead to all these things I was saying, like mental health issues and substance abuse, um, in extreme cases, I've known clergy who have acted out financially in their congregations, for instance, cooking the books or stealing money, or even um, people have acted out sexually. And usually it's when they're, again, interestingly, research, again, this is not my research, but the research would suggest that when people and clergy get themselves most in troubles, when not only when they don't seek help, but when they're trying to be the lone ranger and they're not living in community, 
whether they're disconnected from their spouse or if they're single. Well, either way, whether they're single or in a, in a relationship, they need to have community around them, whether it's a clergy group or have a really good set of friends outside of the church because they're the ones that get themselves in trouble the most. Okay. There's a lot, there's a lot of slides on burnout, so you can take a look at that. So according to um, Tiffany Crystalina, is a re recent study or a qualitative study you know, where she interviewed clergy. She found that there are three greatest reasons for, t for compassion fatigue or uh, leading to burnout was that they lack self-care, that they haven't done inspirational reading or probably even devotions, and they haven't taken vacations. How many clergy do you hear say, I haven't taken a vacation in two years, or I never get away, or I never take my Sabbath, I never take a day off in the week. We, we, we hear that all the time. Damaris, you spoke about that well in your, your opening um, worship. So we all know, and then Beccarino and Gerritsen in um, another study which, have, which occurred in 2013 in New Zealand, um, and it's cited in these slides too, the International Journal of Religion and Spirituality and Society stated that clergy struggle with poor boundaries, time and working hours, rest and Sabbath, and networks of support. So the new piece there is poor boundaries. A lot of clergy, and that relates to what I was saying about pastoral counseling, trying to overextend themselves um, and work with situations that they maybe don't know a lot about, or, or another manifestation of that where they don't know how to say no. And I know I've been guilty of this many times over where you, you pick up a phone call on your day off or you agree to, to extend yourself with an extra meeting. We've all, we struggle with that because after all, aren't we doing God's work? So the four issues, according to these researchers, is that clergy really have to be careful of is maintaining good boundaries, maintaining solid work hours, taking a rest, and having networks of support. And again, I think the thing is for clergy to, to really have a therapist that they see, if not weekly, maybe every other week, maybe monthly. If you're in a relationship, do couples counseling just for growth, not only when you're in crisis, if you have financial issues, and I have to commend the Reformed Church, I know they have a program funded by the Lilly Foundation where they, they help people with debt, because um, debt is so heavy, whether it's student debt or student loan debt or credit card debt, um, debt counseling, spiritual direction. I to say our more liturgical traditions, a lot of times, a lot of, like an you know, Episcopal clergy are required, at least in this diocese here, Newark diocese, are required to a spiritual direction which is a wonderful thing. Um, psychological testing, I think we have not mandated that as a denomination, but I've been talking about that for years, thinking how important it is. A lot of denominations do mandate that before ordination, rather than just mandating it when someone gets in trouble and is up a, in front of a judicial business committee. Um, to not be afraid to take medication. If you're in therapy and your psychotherapist says, hey, you know, this, this depression really isn't going away or the anxiety. I think I'd like you to work with somebody. And again, the therapist and the psychiatrist would work collaboratively around that. And of course, working out good physical health is important. You know, we always say people, it's like not a new idea, you know, mind, body, spirit, that's very faith-based. The whole idea of shalom, right? To be whole. But I was explaining to you, like, there's like a three-legged stool. You have to have good health, good mental health, good spiritual health. And if even one of those things is off, we all feel really out of kilter. Um, of course, I think a lot of clergy avail themselves of, if they're struggling, struggling with substances, avail themselves of 12-step groups, Al-Anon, or a CODA group, and themselves if they struggle. Well, that's if their family member has a substance abuse issue. Or whatever 12-step groups are, there's Overeaters Anonymous, there's a lot, a lot of um, 12 step groups and now with uh all this going on i think there's still 12 most 12 step groups are meeting online now inspirational reading should be a no-brainer right as clergy but how many times do we not take time to do 
devotions or even just to read a good novel. Um, I spoke to sports system, vacations. Um, it's hard to have really good friends we know in the church. So really either have a close relationship with um, family members or out, like extended family members, a sister, cousins. We, in our case, we've been very blessed. We have really solid friends outside of the church. And so you're not always talking church. But of course, um, it's important to develop collegial relationships. One thing when we were living in Albany classes, right, James, he did this really well. We had really strong clergy um, times together as families. And I haven't found this, we haven't done that so well here in these classes in Greater Palisades. But again, support systems in whatever way you can find them. I'm going to go through some cases, which are pretty poignant. These are real cases. Of course, I've changed the names. Um, if you think you recognize them, I think you probably don't know who it is, but I'm sure it sounds like people you know. And if you've been involved in classes work, these are all things that have kind of um, gotten into judicial business situations. Not all, but some of them this one has. I'll read it, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to maybe, maybe James, could we just take a little departure, maybe have a discussion, maybe? Should we do it at, after each case, or maybe at the end? Um, we can do a couple minutes after after each case. Okay, because they're a little bit different. The end. I don't know. Okay. Tell me my, I'm not even paying attention to my time, so just tell me to shut up. you got about 10 minutes. All right, and we'll get through one case maybe then. And you guys, all right. Okay. Bob is a 35-year-old minister who is biracial, Asian Caucasian, is married to another seminary graduate, and they have two teenage daughters. Bob is in his third congregation and doing fairly well, although in his second congregation in another state, he was terminated because he got into a financial malfeasion situation in which he borrowed money from the deacon's fund and did return it after getting caught, however. In his current congregation, Bob developed a daily drinking problem and increasingly distance from his wife and daughters. But I have to add the congregation loves him. So I, and then the next slide I write, Bob became, oh, it was a typo there, sorry. Bob became sober by attending AA meetings, disclosing to his wife his drinking problem, entering into weekly psychotherapy sessions with me, I have to say, and meeting with a monthly spiritual director. So I'm just gonna end there. And tell me your thoughts. How, if you came across a Bob, and you probably know a Bob, how would you help Bob? And it may not be some necessarily clergy, but I, I'd say we can broaden this and say people in the church who are, can get caught up in these things too. So feel free to discuss. Okay, folks, go ahead and um, if you've got a if you've got a thought or a question, go ahead and put your Put your name in the chat file, chat line, and I'll call on you as, you as I see you. We are being very quiet. Oh. Well, I have to say that this gentleman really did get help before his drinking problem became extreme. He, he did go into a debt counseling program too to figure out what that was all about. So he's done a lot of work and he's doing all these things consistently now for over a year. So, and he's really restoring his marriage too. So it's pretty healthy, pretty, it's a good turnout. Okay, we maybe we'll do one more, maybe. Okay. Okay. Okay, Bill is a 50-year-old Caucasian minister who has been ordained for 25 years. He is currently in his fourth congregation and appears to have had a difficult a history of difficult relationships with his consistories and his congregations. It has become apparent to several of his elders and to several of his colleagues that Bill is drinking heavily and that he seems quite depressed. Recently, he came to a class's event in a very, oh, sorry, another title, a disheveled manner. He told a colleague within the last few weeks that he has not opened his mail in months and that he's way behind in his taxes, something like 10 years behind. 
Bill's okay. So this, this, so this, this, this gentleman is still really struggling a lot. So it, Bill's colleague encouraged him to go to AA and to find a psychotherapist and also to speak to a member of his ministerial relations committee. Bill has not done any of these things. How would we help Bill? Thoughts group? You guys are either really tired or these cases are don't, aren't relevant to uh, you or are or just going away. Okay, we have it we have a suggestion. We've got um Oh, I missed it. Okay. Okay, a couple of them. One of them is if he refuses help, this could be a tough situation. Yeah. And of course, making the suggestion that he seek counseling. Um an intervention, I see. An intervention. You. Can you say more about that, Joanne? Um, well, when someone is at the point where they're in this place and they don't feel able to help themselves, I don't know how much more in a typical strategy of just being a confidant, just listening, um, we are able to do. Um, is that a place where colleagues or family or you know, would have an intervention for uh, how it's, you know, uh, uh, how it's impacting everyone? Does the person need to go into uh, counseling, into rehab, into a center? Because it sounds like you know, he's really closer to the edge than we might think if he's not even engaging in the responsibility for his life. You mentioned he's quite depressed. Um, the hopelessness is indicated by he doesn't pay his taxes. He, has, he doesn't look at his mail. Um, you know, is it is it for the next step? You know, our, in our family, we've had experience with having to do intervention with a family member um, to see if we could interrupt the addiction habit. Um, so I don't know if that, that would work in a similar way. Well, are you all familiar with intervention? It's, it's a really, it's something that usually set up with, a, could be another pastor perhaps, or a psychotherapist or a rehab. Professionals should be involved. Yes. <laughs> and you try to get as many family members or close friends involved in, along the room and to try to talk to this individual. And sometimes it's enough to encourage him or her to go to treatment. And sometimes in this case, I think he does need inpatient, not just outpatient mm -hmm. treatment. Um, but sometimes not. And then if it goes on and on and on, obviously there's going to be issues within the congregation right. with the consistory, and that is the case in this situation. Mm -hmm. Which there, there may already be issues in the congregation, just not verbalized. Yeah, in this case they are, but yes, they've been, but they've been brewing for a long time. We have comments over in the Zoom, in the Zoom li chat line from two, two young women um, Lauren, Lauren Suplice and Destiny Morales are undergraduate fellows from Rutgers University who are working with the Reformed Church Center this year in a fellowship that has been created through the New Jersey Fund that, oh, cool. um, the, uh, that we have at New Brunswick that was actually the fund initially established by Elias Van Bunscoten long ago. So um, Lauren also agrees that there's a need for an intervention. Destiny says, I think it could be helpful to have a spiritual leader guide him through these things or keep him accountable, even while doing daily devotions together since he is feeling depressed to help uplift him. So someone who could be gen a gentle, strong arm, if that makes sense, you know, to, to just kind of just take the lead and call him up every day and do that with him. Maybe kind of thing. Destiny, does that sound like what you were talking about? Yeah, I think sometimes, like, 
when someone is depressed, they may feel like unmotivated to do things, unmotivated to reach out. So like, that's that moment where people really like need to, well, it's helpful for people to kind of like meet them where they're at and try to um, encourage them and uplift them and, and try to um, push them beyond maybe what they may think that they can do in a healthy way. Like, um, even if it's like attending a counseling session, I know I had a leader who did that with me, attended a counseling session with me um, and tried to set times to do um, devotions together and keep me accountable in that way. So you know that you're not doing it alone, but you're doing it with someone. So eventually when you do feel stable enough, you can try to do it on your own. Oh, okay. That's like, a, so that's something that you, you, thank you for sharing that, having the courage to share that about your own experience. And then Jill, you put something about uh, transparency. Can you say more about that? when it's appropriate to share personal issues as a uh, pastor with either a part of the congregation in individual relationships or as a whole. And I ask that because I am in a support group with um, a young clergy person who has not shared with the consistory or the church both physical and mental health issues that they've had. And I'm just wondering, how do, we, how do we put that into context? If we invite people to be transparent with us, how transparent should we be with them? Yeah, that's a common issue I see even in even outside of the church with working with individuals, like how much to be transparent with even their employer. It's a little bit different, of course. But so what do you think? I mean, I guess it's so contextualized, right? What 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 is is her or his or her congregation going to be able to handle or be supportive? If they're not, you probably don't want to set her up or I guess I, I don't know if I can take a a broad rule of thumb. What do you guys think? Broad stroke on this. I think it's, I think it has to be talked about though. Or maybe she just say I'm struggling, but it doesn't tell exactly what. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first gentleman I presented did share with his consistory, um, some of some details, but didn't give a lot of details and it. I think, and we had talked about it, and I think it, it worked for him because he, he knew they would generally be supportive. I'm not, I'm not sure that always happens, though. Um, Irma. Yeah, uh, I, I love to compare both uh, vignettes. Uh, the, first, the first one, um, the individual is willing to take that first step and admit that they had a problem. Um, and I think that we, from my experience working with drug users and people who are mentally ill, and um, usually are not ready to take their medications, they usually use drugs to medicate their mental illness. Right, um, exactly. Right, so it's, it's more as a common denominator um, where on one hand, the first one was ready to take that first step and admit that they did something and that they have a problem and they went to their wives and they took steps towards healing. And the second scenario, uh, when we're talking about interventions and all the other stuff, uh, you were kind of like forcing this person to admit something that they're not ready to admit to themselves. So I think that maybe the approach is to um, support them in where they are and meet them. I like the... Uh, comment that was made that to meet them where they're at right now, just like the women at the well or the women uh, yeah. that approach Jesus uh, with the issue of blood, just to meet them where they're at so that yeah, they can come to that, to that um, realization that there is a problem. And so there's other alternatives. You have harm reduction. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that term. Yeah. Um, where you can bring that up. Yeah, so that you provide a, a, a place where, because we, we have to continue to destigmatize drug use and, 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 and mental illness. So these are two very stigmatized situations. So in order to provide harm reduction, 
so that we can meet them where they're at and find out how much they use, the frequency of their use and the quantity of their use and, and see how we can manage and stay in that gray area so that um, we don't condemn the person and, and make them feel like they're doing something wrong. Um, and I think that until they, they come to that realization, intervention may help, but it, it, could, it could work both ways. Mm-hmm. It could either push them further away or bring them closer. So right yeah. now in this critical time where they are in their mental health and their and that willingness to admit that they have a problem, maybe it's something that we can consider. Thank you for that. Yes, thank you. So every case is individual, I guess I kind of think is what we're saying. But the, the point is someone, someone needs to walk the, along the journey with this person. Okay, um, we have another question from Bianca. Is the church really equipped to deal with this type of situation if he continues to decline help? If he, or should, I guess this is a separate part. If he continues to decline help, then he may need to seek professional help. The question is then, how can the church support him after he gets help? I think that, well, it is different in different denominations, but in our polity, it would be usually we, most classes have a ministry relations committee or something like that, where probably in our classes, we have it as two separate things. Church supervision committee would work with a congregation to help them heal. If, there, if it's a real extreme case, like where there's been malfeasance or an acting out, and then the, the, the minister, whether he's getting help or not getting help would really needs to be assisted by just a colleague walking alongside him again. And then in the extreme cases, it becomes a judicial business where if someone does mm-hmm. some harm and, and, and someone brings him up on him or her up on charges. But um, I think the church isn't necessarily equipped to do the professional part of it, but we are hopefully equipped to have the courage to walk alongside of this person and not just ignore it. Mm-hmm. Even in, in Bill's case, where he won't get the help, um, I think we we can't forget it. We need to keep checking in. That's uh, my perspective, anyway. Too often we just let it go by till it gets he gets deeper and deeper into his addiction or into his depression. Um, so Joanne asks, when we know this level of struggle exists, what is our accountability to everyone involved? I guess as the neighbor pastor or the classes member. Yeah, to reach out to him or her, I guess. Maybe even do it public, not do it publicly, but in a private way. If you're really concerned, I guess you would probably speak to someone who has more authority to help, but I guess start with just being a, a colleague. Mm-hmm. Okay. Joanne, did you have something you wanted to? I think that may have been a random sound <laughs> because she showed up, but nothing happened. Um, and finally, Devana points out um, she thought. Am I on now? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Sorry. I don't know what was happening. It was going back and forth. So yes, it was just. Um, it was kind of the the royal we, you know, when we are in, you know, at the consistory level, and when we're at the church level, when we're at the classes level, um, you know, when. I guess I'm not even sure how to frame the question, but. I've been, I'm in two denominations and I experience in both waiting too long. Yes, yes. Wait too long to deal with a a problem um, out of deference to the individual um, and our compassion and our care. And I don't want to say that's a bad thing, but it's a bad thing when it goes too long. And now it's, you know, um, and then it's a, such a bigger issue, you know, when it's not, um, when it, we wait too long, just make, keep it. Yes. Yes. That. We see something happening. We see a congregation struggling. We see a pastor struggling. Um, 
but we don't want to, we want to balance that with care and opportunity. And um, I, I don't know if there's a point where we can say, you know what, now, now we have to, we have to do something. We have to protect the individual before they make a mistake they can't undo. Um, and then lose everything. How do we protect a person from themselves? How do we protect the congregation from someone who's now, um, you know, beginning to look for ways to fill the void or the sorrow or, you know, boundary issues in any number of things, you know, all of the things that in all of these cases people have done, it's because they've reached a kind of a point of no return. And yeah. Um, how do we, you know, do we have the tools? Do we need better tools? Um, but I've seen it happen uh, too many times where we wait too long. And um, how can we be better at that? Maybe that's because people will refuse to acknowledge a problem like this gentleman um, has refused all of the information and advice given to him. So at what point do we have to call him or her or whoever's in this situation sh up short and say, well, you can't go on this way because it's now gonna damage your family, yourself, your congregation. Um, so how can we cast this safety net for you so we can get through this? And perhaps just saying that to him is, is, a, is, is an intervention. Mm -hmm. He might be threatened by it, but I think then you go. You, that's when you probably do speak up in confidence to someone in classes to say, "Okay, what are we going to do here to help this person?" Because mm -hmm. you're right. Too many. We've all seen this too. Too many churches have been damaged by these situations. Too many congregations, I should say, and and individuals. And individuals, right? So like we can't, boundary crossing. Where do we stand when we have to say we have to save this person from themselves because they have no longer the tools to um, logically keep perspective on what's happening, and that right. often happens to us when we fall into some uh, despair, whatever that comes from. You know, how do we get the person back to the other side of of, of health? Um, with and safely for themselves and for everyone they interact with. That could even go all the way back to our conversation on uh, divorce and struggles of clergy in their uh, marriages and that kind yes. of Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's all, it's all, I guess, and the, uh, it's all connected. Right. Well, thank, thank you again, Pam. Um, thank you, everybody. We've given each other lots of things to think about. Um, we started to think through some good things that, and started, I'm sure, conversations that are going to continue for a while. <laughs> but our time to um, be together is just about done. And so I'm going to call on Pastor Damaris to um, lead us in a closing prayer. And hope that she is still, the, she was there a minute ago, so I'm hoping she's able to respond. Technology is so wonderful when it works, and then there's these other times. Oh, no, that's still. Let, it, let us take a moment and join our hearts and our minds in prayer as we get ready to go. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of this day, for the gift to reach out from beyond our social distancing and to be with one another for the gift of these wise women who have helped us to think about things that it takes courage to be honest about, things that the church faces and needs to face better. Be with each of us as we return to our more solitary pursuits, as we do ministry in our own contexts, to have courage and to help others have courage to reach out to one another, to help one another. 
Watch over us all until we can gather together again. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all, and um, have a lovely rest of your weekend. Um, whatever sort of worship you're going to be having, may it go well. And um, there's Damaris. <laughs> I'm sorry I had a little bit of technical difficulty getting myself unmuted. Uh, uh, but thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you. And we will. I hope to see you all again sometime in person before too long. Take yes. care, everyone. Thank you. thank you for putting this together, James. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.